What is up you guys and welcome back to my channel. So today we're going to be speaking about quite the whirlwind of a case. I've mentioned this on Instagram and interestingly enough, I feel like not many people are as aware of this case as they should be. So it is about the unsolved, well now unsolved murder of an 11 year old girl named Holly Staker from Waukegan, Illinois. And it's also about the wrongful conviction of a man named Juan Rivera who was convicted of this young girl's murder three separate times, obviously before being exonerated. This case is a prime, prime example of the massive failures in our justice system and when things go unchecked, what can happen. I've spoken about a few other wrongful convictions on my channel. They're kind of difficult to speak on unless there's already been an exoneration. Um, but I have spoken about the Innocence Project before, which for those of you that don't know, they basically work to exonerate the wrongfully convicted, as you can assume, through DNA and different advances in technology. And I, and I donate to them monthly. It's something that I suggest everyone do if they have the opportunity to, because wrongful convictions are way more common than you would believe. And also, it's the main reason why I personally am not a huge supporter of uh, the death penalty, which I don't think I've even ever openly stated on my channel before. But the main reason is because of situations like this, because the accuracy of our government and our justice system is not 100%, but ending someone's life is. But before I get into the details of this very long-winded and complicated situation involving multiple cases and people. First of all, go grab a snack, cozy up because we're going to be here for a while. And I also have to thank Audible as always for partnering with me on today's video. Audible is the leading provider for spoken word entertainment and my personal favorite way to consume content very quickly and easily. Audible offers a huge variety of audiobooks, Audible originals, meditations, sleep tracks, guided fitness, you name it, they've got it. And with genres ranging from true crime, sci-fi, history, thrillers, to kids audiobooks, there really is something for absolutely everybody. It makes it even easier that your Audible library is accessible anytime, anywhere, from any device, so you can listen on the go or from the comfort of your own home. I've always been very fascinated in wrongful convictions, and since that's also the topic of today's video, I've been listening to the audiobook called Anatomy of Innocence, which has been very eye-opening so far. It's about the realities of wrongful convictions and how they used to be an anomaly, but unfortunately now they are almost a regular occurrence. It follows 14 separate inmates that had been exonerated, including the first to be exonerated from death row through DNA evidence, and they get to really explain what they went through and what it was like being wrongfully convicted and losing so many years of their life. In my personal opinion, it's a very important thing to listen to, to understand what's actually happening in regards to wrongful convictions and ways that you can help. An Audible membership is great to have also, not just to kind of kick back and relax, but to expand your knowledge, which is one of my favorite ways to use it. And they even have an all new plus catalog that is included in your membership at no extra cost with an endless variety of selections right at your fingertips. On top of that, as a member, you receive one credit every single month Month, good for any title that you can keep forever. If you want to check out Anatomy of Innocence or any other amazing title, podcast, whatever it may be on Audible, head over to audible.com forward slash Danielle or text code Danielle to 500, 500 and you will get a free audiobook, a 30 day free trial, and of course, access to the plus catalog. But thank you again to Audible for sponsoring today's video. And now on to the details of this case. All right, you guys, like I said, absolutely buckle in. There's so many moving parts to this. And unfortunately, there's not really a whole ton of closure on the other side. So I guess I'll just start from the very beginning, which was the murder of this 11 year old girl named Holly Staker. So on August 17th, 1992, I was like two weeks old when this happened. 11 year old Holly Staker from Waukegan, Illinois, went to babysit a five year old and a two year old nearby while their mother worked. Now, everything seemed okay, uh, and the children's mother eventually returned home from work later that evening and thought it was very odd that her five-year-old son was sitting outside the front door by himself. When she walked up to him and asked him what on earth he was doing, he told her that he had been locked out of the house for quite some time now, and every single time he knocked on the door, there was no response, but Holly and the two-year-old were supposed to be inside. 
The mother entered the home thinking something had to be wrong for this to even be happening, and she quickly was proven right. She saw that the back door had been kicked in or smashed in in some way, and someone had clearly been inside of the house. When she ran to the children's bedroom to see if her two-year-old daughter was okay and Holly was all right, she found her two-year-old daughter sitting safe and all right on the bed, but Holly, unfortunately, was on the floor, unresponsive and covered in blood. When authorities arrived, they discovered that the back door had in fact been smashed in using a blue mop that had been sitting on the back porch and it was still sitting there with just a random towel sitting beside it. There was blood pretty much all over the home. It appeared as if someone tried to wash their hands in the kitchen sink. There was also blood found on the banister of the stairs and Holly had been very brutally attacked. She was partially clothed, which indicated to them there was the possibility of a sexual assault, and it was unfortunately very obvious she had been stabbed over and over again. Over 70 fingerprints and palm prints were taken from the home, as well as swabs of the blood on the sink and on the banister, and they pretty much checked everything they possibly could to make sure that they were able to find this monster that somehow broke into this home and so horribly attacked this 11-year-old girl. The following day, an autopsy was done on Holly's body, and it gave more light into what this individual did to her. She had been stabbed 27 times. Um, that's a lot. That seems like a very personal type of situation or just someone that is totally deranged. And as if that wasn't enough, she was also strangled at some point. And just prior to her death, she was sexually assaulted to the point that she received massive injuries from it, which is devastating. They did manage to find samples, DNA samples from the sexual assault from the perpetrator and it, they collected them hoping that maybe DNA would eventually help in this investigation. The same exact day as well that the autopsy was performed, authorities were doing another search and they managed to find a serrated knife that had been snapped in half in the neighbor's yard, quite literally just feet away from where Holly was babysitting, the home she was babysitting at. So they believed there was a huge chance that they had found the murder weapon. So I'm sure you're thinking at this point, okay, they have DNA from the attacker because of the sexual assault. That could possibly lead them to the killer. It's 92. DNA testing was a thing at this point. It was still kind of young, but it was a thing. And they also have over 70 fingerprints and palm prints. Granted, it was very likely a lot of them belonged to the family. Since this person clearly washed their hands and touched the banister and other things, some of them are bound to be the killers, right? And then you have the potential murder weapon. So this should have been relatively simple and it wasn't. For weeks, authorities tried to track down the killer, and within 10 weeks, they actually got really close to someone, and this someone was a 19-year-old named Juan Rivera who lived about two miles away from the home Holly was babysitting at. So Juan was unfortunately very well known by Lake County Police. He had been on probation for a burglary he participated in a little bit prior. He actually was wearing an electronic monitoring system at the time of the murder. And shortly after the murder, I believe he was picked up and incarcerated. I don't know if it was a probation violation or what exactly was going on, but he was in fact, you know, incarcerated shortly after the murder. It was a really big red flag to authorities when another inmate that had spoken to Juan came forward and said that Juan claimed to him that he knew who killed Holly. Juan allegedly told this inmate that he was at a party the night of Holly's murder. Uh, I think it was only, probably only a few blocks away tops. And he said that there was a man at the party that was behaving strangely. He believed that this man was possibly on cocaine and that explained his nervous behavior um, or that he was possibly involved in Holly's murder. Juan told this inmate that this man repeatedly left the party and then would come back and then would leave again and come back. And then the last stretch that he was gone, he was gone for at least an hour. And when he came back, he had scratches on his face and blood on him and he was acting very nervous. Apparently shortly after this, the entire party heard sirens. So they went outside to see what was going on and 
this person took the opportunity to flee the house while everyone else was walking towards the situation to see what had happened this individual ran away. So authorities are obviously like, okay, this is one step closer. You know, we have this inmate who clearly has ties to criminals and he might actually know something. So they went to figure out about this party and they questioned Juan. And when they figured out where he claimed this party was at and spoke to the residents of the home, that party had never even occurred. This obviously made authorities believe, okay, Juan has something to hide. Why would he lie about a party? Why would he say something to this inmate? And they believed it was possible that he was involved in some way. So from October 26th to October 29th, Juan was questioned. So the first day, I believe Juan it took a polygraph test and the test came back inconclusive. And for the next 24 hours straight, he was questioned. The entire time he gave numerous varying events of where he was the day of the murder and what happened the day of the murder, but he was very adamant that he knew nothing about it and that he didn't know Holly Staker. He had never seen her before. So authorities obviously pressured him trying to figure out, well, then why did you lie about this party? Why did you tell an inmate you knew who killed her? At this point, Juan still kept to the story that he had no knowledge of the crime, but he did admit to authorities that he made up this party, that this party never happened. He was never there. This guy that he saw, all of it was fabricated. But when authorities asked him why, he couldn't give them a reason. He said he had absolutely no idea. Personally, from my standpoint, I could see a few ways that this can go. It either is because Juan was trying to hide something or because he was 19 years old and incarcerated. And this is something that you commonly see when individuals are incarcerated, they constantly want to say that they know things about crime. They always want to up like their street credit with people and you know, their credit with people in jail and in prison. And they will fabricate these stories to make it seem like they know more and they're badder. And it easily could have been that as well, especially because Juan was only 19. But authorities were not taking the fact that he just made it up and wasn't involved as an answer. So for the next three days, he continued to be relentlessly questioned. That entire time, he maintained his innocence up until midnight on the fourth day. So at this point, detectives were obviously irritated. I feel like when anyone is in a situation where you're interrogating someone for about four days straight, there were some breaks, but he was interrogated most of the time, you get frustrated and authorities began to accuse Juan of killing Holly. And eventually at around midnight that fourth day, he broke down put his head down on the table and started crying. And at this point, when authorities asked him if he had anything to do with the murder of Holly Staker, he nodded his head, yes. The interrogation from this point continued for three more hours. And the kicker in all of this, Juan never had any representation. A lawyer was never with Juan, from my understanding, the entire time that he was being interrogated. So detectives left after this three hours of basically trying to figure out his confession and what he claims happened and what he did. And they leave to go and type up this confession at about 3 a.m. However, all this questioning, days worth of questioning by authorities and accusations really affected Juan and he suffered from a psychotic episode shortly after authorities left. Juan had to be taken to a padded room. He was repeatedly slamming his head against the wall. He was pulling his own hair out. He was in desperate need of medical attention and authorities weren't giving it to him. He was in distress because the backstory of Juan is that not only was he just 19 years old, but he also had an IQ of 79. He was a special needs student and had a very long and lengthy history of mental illness, which probably would have been noted in his file. He should have been represented the entire time he was being interrogated. He shouldn't have been questioned for days straight because of his mental health condition. And the fact that these authorities thought it was acceptable to bring this 19 year old, um, you know, special needs individual into an interrogation room for four days straight and relentlessly attack him is just the start of the numerous ways the justice system failed him. So 
As I said, no representation. They typed up this confession and at 8 a.m., despite Juan having a clear mental breakdown, a absolute psychotic episode where he needed attention, medical attention, authorities still came back. They showed up to the padded room he was in and they told him to sign the confession, which he did. So at this point, authorities took the confession to the state attorney. His name was Michael Waller. And they were like, here you go. We've got this confession. We've solved this murder. Let's wrap this up. But when Michael Waller looked at the confession, he noted numerous inconsistencies. I'm talking what Juan said in his confession did not at all match up with what they knew about the murder. So Michael Waller told detectives yet again to go and interrogate Juan another time. At this point, it was 1130 in the morning. It was just a few hours after he signed his first confession, just a few hours after he had clearly had some sort of breakdown and authorities showed back up to question him again. And essentially what is believed to have happened is that authorities fed him the information that he needed to say because they sat him down and they were like, you know, this is inconsistent. It's not what we need to hear, you need to tell us the truth. And so they got a second confession. It was agreed upon that it was more consistent. Juan signed it within an hour and a half of being questioned. And so now authorities had a second confession that they were going to work with. At this point, Juan was arrested and charged in the murder and sexual assault of Holly Staker and a press conference was immediately held. And at this, it was announced they had a confession that they had Holly Staker's killer and that they knew for a fact they had the right man because Juan knew information that only the killer would know. And also they never recorded any of the interrogation. So this brings us to Juan's first trial. His first trial began on November 1st, 1993. So about a year later with three counts of first degree murder being what he was facing. The entire trial in my personal opinion was an absolute mess because the defense came in very, very strong. In the trial, the defense made it clear that at the time of the murder, Juan had been on probation because of these burglary charges and he was wearing an electronic monitoring system. So one of the fastest ways that you could have ruled him out as being at the crime scene was by checking what his location was. It was constantly monitoring where he was at. And according to the documentations that they had, Juan had been at his home two miles away at the time of the murder, as well as all the time before and all the time after. He was at home the entire time and unless he performed some sort of witchcraft craziness and managed to get off his monitoring system leave and come back and put it back on then it wasn't very likely that Juan was the one who committed this crime and the prosecution really didn't have much to fight with and the largest thing that they ended up claiming they had before the trial started was even withdrawn so the prosecution claimed that they had a pair of Juan's sneakers and they said that these sneakers had blood on them. And when they tested the blood, the blood came back as Holly. So this was basically to disprove the idea that the monitoring system maybe was faulty or he somehow got out of it because his sneakers that they took from his home were covered in Holly's blood, meaning he wore them when he killed her. But when the defense went through all of the entered evidence, which is what happens typically in a trial, both sides enter in evidence and they kind of look through all the documentation to figure out you know, what their arguments are going to be, what their defense is going to be. They were able to provide solid evidence that there's no way that this was possible. The defense had solid evidence, I'm assuming in the form of a receipt or something of the sorts that Juan didn't have the shoes until after Holly's murder. And at the time of her murder, they weren't even available for purchasing in the United States. His family gifted the shoes to him after the murder. So there's no way that Holly's DNA could have been there unless it was planted but we'll also get to that later. So of course, immediately after this, the prosecution decided to withdraw that piece of evidence. They took the shoes out of the trial. They did not want it to be spoken about. Um, they didn't want any of this information out there, which was fascinating because that was the only bit of physical evidence that they were actually using at the trial, which is also fascinating because there was DNA 
that was found. Essentially, the only thing that the prosecution had left to go off of at this point was the second confession, and they felt like that was pretty much enough. They did have the prints that were found at the home, but interestingly enough, those also didn't come back to Juan. They did match the mother, both of the children, and Holly, but the rest of the prints were considered open prints, which means that they hadn't been identified. And I'm not sure if the prosecution tried to say they were just smudged and not good print, so that's why they couldn't compare it to Juan and kind of left it as a questionable thing. According to what I know, the knife that they had that they believed to possibly be the murder weapon was, from what I've heard, potentially destroyed. Um, no DNA, no forensic testing had been done on it. So basically the prosecution just pounded the confession and also the fact that you know, wanted told authorities things that only the attacker would know. And on November 19th, Juan Rivera was found guilty for the murder of Holly Staker. Now, originally the death penalty was sought, which like immediately makes my whole chest tighten up knowing what I know about the rest of this case. Um, but thankfully that idea was entirely rejected and instead Juan was sentenced to life in prison by judge Christopher Stark, who would also participate in the rest of his trials. So three years later, after spending three long years in prison for this murder on November 9th, 1996, the Illinois Court of Appeals reversed the conviction and sentence based on numerous trial errors. So what was brought forward by Juan's defense is that Judge Stark had improperly ruled during the trial, which prevented Juan from defending himself properly against the prosecution, which one of your rights is the right to a defense. And when that is unnecessarily being struck down by the judge, there's a serious issue there. The second trial started two years later on September 16th, 1998, and this time Juan's lawyers tried to get the expert testimony of a social psychologist. And this social psychologist was using, I guess like controversial science, um, that proved the confession that Juan gave was actually a false one. However, it was determined by the judge that this type of testimony and evidence was inadmissible in court. They said that this type of testimony and the science that was being used wasn't uh, accepted widely in the psychiatric community, so therefore his testimony would not be allowed. So again, just like the first trial, Everything relied heavily on the confession and the defense's hands were tied. But one pretty important thing did change in terms of the prosecution's evidence. So in the second trial, the prosecution called forward a very important witness that claimed to see the murder, which is a very, very big deal. This witness was the two-year-old girl that had been in the room. Now she was eight at the time of the trial, but she was only two at the time of the murder. So you can see how that's very controversial. The little girl stated that she remembered the events of the night. She remembered going to pick up ingredients for pizza with Holly, and then they came back and they made the pizza. She remembered her little brother going outside to play. And then she remembered being inside with Holly when some strange man broke into the back door. And she made it very clear that Holly did not let this individual in. Um, all she remembered at this point was that the man put her on the bed in the bedroom and then dragged Holly into the room as well. And she said that she witnessed this person stab Holly three times in the stomach. After this, she had already left the stand. She never identified Juan as the individual that she saw, but she was recalled to the stand and specifically asked this. And she did confirm that Juan was the man that had broken into the home that day. You can understand why this was very controversial because how reliable is the statement from someone who witnessed this when they were only two years old. Granted, trauma can do very crazy things to the brain, um, so that easily maybe could have been the reason why she was able to remember so many things because it was a traumatic memory that really sticks out. But a lot of people weren't really sold on it, including the judge. And the prosecution said that they would bring forward two different expert witnesses that essentially would be able to confirm her memory, that what she was saying was valid, um, that she was recalling this from her actual memories and not just what she's been told or what she's seen over the years. And everyone was kind of hanging on hearing this from the prosecution. They wanted to hear these two expert witnesses because you want to believe this little girl, you don't want to dismiss her, but at the same time, you need to know that 
it's truthful and it's not something that's just been fed to a child, which is also very likely. Now, for some reason, the prosecution refused to subpoena the two experts and the judge even told the prosecution, you know, they can switch around appointments. Moving two to three appointments to come here and testify is not going to bother them. Um, but the prosecution kept saying things like, oh yeah, well, we don't want to make them mad. Like, we'll just hope they come. We'll just ask and hope they say yes. So they didn't seem very dedicated to proving you know, the validity of their own witness, which was very bizarre. So ultimately, neither expert showed up and all of that was very up in the air. They even brought in the inmate that Juan had confided in and he even changed his entire story. So when he had originally come to police and made a statement, he just said that Juan mentioned that he knew who killed Holly and pretty much ended it at that. I don't even know how much he knew about the party, but all of a sudden, once he got on stand, he was saying that Juan was saying all these horrible things about Holly when they spoke and that he was calling her a tease and saying that she deserved everything that she got. And obviously this paints kind of a little bit of a different picture, but he also never had stated this to anybody prior to being on stand. They also brought forward an individual that was living at the home Juan claimed the party was at that night. This individual stated that as always, he confirmed there was absolutely no party there. All of the individuals that lived in the home also conf with him also confirmed that there was no party that night. And he even said that Juan approached him after authorities first started talking to him and was like, you know, they're trying to railroad me. Will you just please say that you're with me that night? And obviously this person denied basically being his alibi for obvious reasons. He didn't want to catch himself up in the middle of a murder investigation. So we've got all of this very questionable information from Juan. Um, the fact that he changed his story numerous times, we have him begging people to be an alibi. So yeah, obviously this does look very suspicious, but the prosecution's not really proving much on their side either. The defense was able to bring forward something very important. Despite the fact that many of their experts were denied to come to trial, they were able to hire a licensed clinical psychologist and bring him forward. And he testified about the way Juan was interrogated. He stated that Juan was decompensated, which essentially means that he was unable to respond in a manner that is logical or coherent, at least while he was being interrogated, because of the amount of emotional distress he was under. It had been hours and hours and days of interrogations and accusations, and he eventually broke. And this clinical psychologist stated that once individuals get in that state where they are decompensated, they will pretty much do anything at all to escape the situation they're in. It's almost like triggering a fight or flight mode in their brain. And the moment that Juan all of a sudden broke down, he stood strong for four days saying, I didn't do this. And then all of a sudden, once he's accused and really um, pushed hard, he started crying, just broke down. Like his whole body basically just went limp. And the clinical psychologists believe that this is when it first started happening. And why from that point on, Juan pretty much just said, yeah, to everything that was said to him. Once closing arguments were all tied up with a bow, jurors went into deliberation and it was a crapshoot. Um, jurors wrote that, at least a few of them, without physical evidence, there, they felt there was no way they could convict Juan um, as being guilty beyond a reasonable doubt because you have a total lack of physical evidence or forensic evidence that's brought forward by either side supporting that Juan was involved in the crime. The defense obviously was able to say based on the electronic monitoring system that he wasn't there based on that. But then at the same time, you've got these witnesses that are coming forward saying, oh yeah, he said he was there. He said he was involved. So it was very confusing for them. And they asked for uh, copies of 10 different witness statements because that was pretty much other than the confession, what the prosecution was relying on. Um, and they wanted to look at them deeper and see if they believed they were truthful or if they saw any inconsistencies. But for some reason, the deputy that they asked for this information said that it would take too long to print them all off and gather them and refused to give it to them. At this point, the jury was just stuck. 
They were stuck. A lot of them were angry. The jury repeatedly told officials that they were at a standstill because of this lack of evidence and that they needed access to this information and they needed help and assistance and some sort of guidance. And every time that they would go to ask officials for help, they would be shot down, told to basically turn around, lock yourself back in the room and keep deliberating until you figure it out. But it got to the point that these individuals, it was like the Hunger Games, like they apparently were just going at each other. The tension was incredibly high. They did not agree with each other. There were lots of arguments and it got so bad that they basically came out and said, we're not moving forward. We cannot move forward. So either do something or we're stuck here. After this, uh, officials did show the jurors a couple of different things. And after 26 hours of deliberation on October 2nd, Juan was found guilty for the second time. Now, immediately after being found guilty, the eight-year-old girl uh, recanted her identification of Juan as being the intruder. She came forward, said that she actually couldn't say for sure if it was Juan or not. Her memory, you know, wasn't there for that. And because of this, because the jury very obviously relied so heavily on the witness statements, the defense asked for a new trial. They're like, you know, half the reason this jury probably convicted this man is because this girl's claiming she saw him there and she saw the attack. But unfortunately, it was denied. And Juan was sentenced to life in prison. The case was brought back to the Court of Appeals in 2001 for the second time, uh, and unfortunately, they decided to stick with the conviction, likely because he'd already received two guilty convictions, and it was probably going to take a crazy miracle in order to prove that he wasn't responsible, and that's essentially what happened. So in 2004, the defense filed a motion to have DNA testing done on the sample taken from the sexual assault that is believed to be from the perpetrator. Now, I personally do not understand why it wasn't done prior to this. I don't know why it wasn't included in either of the first two trials. DNA testing was absolutely around. I'm assuming it may have something to do with the price of it. But either way, on May 24th, 2005, the DNA testing was done. The DNA from the sexual assault linked to the perpetrator was matched to Juan. And guess what? It wasn't a match. So on August 29th, 2006, because the DNA taken from the crime, um, assumed to be by the attacker, didn't match Juan, the man convicted twice for the murder, uh, Judge Stark, who had given both the prior sentences, decided to vacate Juan's conviction. So he was supposed to be a free man now, you know, he, there was DNA proving that he was not the one who sexually assaulted this girl. Um, he was at that point, likely not the person that killed her either. Um, there was never any suggestion or any evidence that pointed towards there being more than one attacker at the time. So it essentially ruled him out that with the fact that they had no other physical evidence tying him to it, no fingerprints that linked him. Uh, but despite having this DNA evidence, despite the judge that saw this trial two times occur right in front of his eyes, despite him being like, you know what, we really messed up. Attorney Waller, for some reason, decided to take Juan to trial for a third time. On April 13th, 2009, Rivera went to trial for the third time, again under Judge Stark. And this time, the prosecution obviously had to find some way to prove that Juan was responsible despite DNA from the sexual assault not being a match. And the way they went about it is so wildly disturbing. So I'm just going to warn you now, um, it's hard to hear. It was suggested by the prosecution that the DNA should be discounted. They claimed that the sample taken from something that had been proved by a medical examiner to be a sexual assault, something that they had claimed in the prior two trials was a sexual assault, was actually consensual. I will repeat, the prosecution said that 11-year-old Holly Staker had consensual sex before being murdered, and that's where the DNA come, came from. She's 11. She couldn't consent. So the fact that a prosecutor could stand up in front of a whole entire courtroom, and they're so desperate to 
get this man back in prison, that they are willing to say that an 11 year old girl somehow was able to consent to sex and totally disregard the fact that she was very badly sexually assaulted to the point where she had horrific injuries from it is just mind blowing. And I know way more details than that, but I am refusing to say them out loud. To make it even worse, the prosecution brought in Holly's twin sister who spoke about the fact that they were sexually assaulted by their brother's friend when they were eight years old, amongst many other things. And all of this, according to the prosecution, proved that Holly Staker was in fact sexually active. And so that sample was from someone she was having a relationship with. They're creating like this hypothetical individual that she had a relationship with, but they wanted to also make sure this person though didn't murder her. So it was absolutely wild. And in case this plan didn't work, they even made this suggestion that the lab actually contaminated the sample. So there's still a chance that it might be Juan's. The DNA was just compromised. However, the defense was able to shoot this down so quick and so fast, which I am so thankful for. First of all, I cannot imagine having to sit at a trial where the prosecution just is repeatedly talking about the sex life of an 11 year old. Um, I can't imagine that, but the defense was able to say that DNA had been taken from quite literally everyone that knew Holly. It had been taken from her dad, from every male relative, every male neighbor, every male acquaintance, everyone who could have potentially had some sort of sexual relationship with her. And it, there was never a match. There was never a match. And on top of that, you can't argue too much with the fact that whoever left that sexually assaulted her based on the injuries and a medical professional's opinion. They were also able to prove that the sexual assault based on the sample taken occurred quite literally immediately prior to her death. When it came to this other idea that the prosecution had that um, there was some sort of contamination involved, they took a look at the DNA and had there been some sort of contamination, there would have been something like a second profile involved, like another individual's DNA mixed in with the DNA taken from um, Holly, but there was no sign of that. It was, it was very clear as day, one profile from one individual that attacked her immediately before her death. So they were able to just totally smash down what the prosecution had brought forward. But the prosecution still just kept on trying and kept on bringing forward witnesses. And this kind of goes to show how desperate they seem to be getting. They brought forward statements from two separate individuals, um, both of which were no longer alive. So they basically were relying on these individuals for their witness statements. But since they weren't alive, they decided to just read the statements out. Both of these individuals that they so badly wanted to include, despite their death and inability to be at the trial, had reasons as to why they would lie or fabricate a story about this. One of the individuals actually tried to sell his story to Chicago Tribune for a lot of money. And typically that's never a good sign. And then the other one only claimed to know information months and months after the crime and only because he was facing a probation violation and hope to get off of it by giving up information. So even these two witnesses that they're trying to bring forward after death still just are not to be trusted. You've heard all of this. You've heard all of this disastrous third trial. You've heard that the DNA did not belong to Juan. On May 8th, for the third time after 35 hours of deliberation, somehow this jury found Juan guilty Again, and on June 25th, 2009, Judge Stark for the third time sentenced Juan to life in prison. Now I'm personally in disbelief it even went this far. And I'm honestly also very concerned about the jurors, which I will kind of touch on towards the end of the video. At this point, Juan was desperate for help. And he turned to a man named Lawrence Marshall, who is the co-founder of the Center of Wrongful Convictions and also a law professor. And Marshall worked closely with Jenner and Block LLP as well as the Wrongful Conviction Center to hopefully entirely dismantle the prosecution's case, which had already been done, in my opinion, numerous times, but they wanted to make sure it was done and Juan was exonerated. They found a ton of errors. They worked for, I believe, a couple of years on the case, and then they introduced all of this information and really just basically shoved everything in the prosecution's face. One of the errors they found was that Juan's confession should have been suppressed because 
Um, they were both involuntary. Obviously, he was in mental distress. There was a lack of representation. Um, the list goes on and on when it comes to these confessions basically being beat out of him. And the second confession was essentially hand fed to him, which I will speak on more in another point in all of their list. So also they believed that evidence provided was nowhere near enough to find Juan guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's probably the one thing that's irritated me the most out of this and it stuck out the most because according to court documents, which I have a lot of them linked down below, every single jury came forward at one point and said that lack of physical evidence was a problem and that they at that point you know really felt like they couldn't prove him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt so what happened along the way they also brought forward the fact that holly's information in regards to her prior sexual activity which was used in the third trial was violated that that whole situation was a violation of the illinois rape shield statute which essentially means that what well, prohibits the admission of evidence of prior sexual activity of someone or their reputation when it comes to their sexual identity or activity if they're a victim of a sexual assault. So she was a very obvious victim of a sexual assault and you don't dismiss that by saying, yeah, but she was sexually active and that means this didn't happen. And they believed this was a total violation under that statute. They also argued that Juan was not fully allowed his right to a defense, which had already been ruled after his first trial and for some reason was just repeatedly continued at every trial afterwards. Prosecution made claims left and right through all three trials and even at the press conference after he was arrested that Juan knew information that only the perpetrator would know. Now. Juan's defense did try to bring forward evidence to prove this false. And Judge Stark denied presentation of this evidence. So he was not even allowed to argue this statement that was, again, one of the large factors in his conviction. To elaborate even more so, we already know about the press conference where it was stated, you know, they arrested him because he knew things that only you know, the killer would know. Um, at the third trial, there was a sergeant that actually came on stand and testified the same thing that the facts one told him um, and, and the interrogation was information he didn't even know at the time. Now, and he said this as confidently as he could, but the defense actually had solid evidence, AKA the police's own files, showing that every single accurate piece of information that was eventually in the confession was information the authorities already knew. Every single officer interrogating him or in contact with him knew every single piece of this information. So Juan wasn't telling them any, anything new. And to top it off, Juan could have easily got it from the media because not only did they claim it was information they didn't know and they lied about it, but all of the information that Juan stated in the confession was stuff that had been blasted all over the news. So what they claimed was entirely false. We also know that the defense numerous times refused to allow criminal experts to the stand. The defense had many, many other experts lined up ready to go that were willing to testify about, um, you know, suspects that are of below average intelligence, have like a lower IQ, individuals that, uh, you know, possibly suffer with mental illness. They're susceptible to suggestion. They are more prone to fabricating experiences because when they're being asked questions repeatedly by author an authority figure, you know, keep in mind their mindset's almost like that of a child and they're like, oh, I've got to find answers because if I don't, I'm going to get in trouble. And so they'll fabricate these different experiences and they will feel reprimanded and that if they don't just go with it, that they're going to be in trouble and there's going to be a problem and whatever is suggested to them, they will just blindly believe. It's very well could be exactly what happened to Juan. He's in there without representation and no one to defend him. He, uh, you know, is a below average intelligence and needed someone there to help him. I took it as an opportunity and basically fed him the information 
and railroaded him until he cracked and gave it to them. They also were able to come forward and say that a few of the different investigators that worked on the case did end up admitting that they had leaked little bits of information about the murder to Juan. They were like, oh, well, was she wearing a nightgown? She was wearing a nightgown? Yes, she was. Okay, um, you broke in the back door. Was it met with a mop? Like that sort of situation, like just feeding him this information. They also pointed out that the prints from the home did not match Juan. Uh, like I said, they matched the mother, the two children, Holly, um, and there was an open print. The expert was able to fully rule out that these random prints in the home, likely from the attacker, weren't Juan. So now you have DNA in the home that's not his in connection to the attack, and then handprints that are not his in connection to the attack, yet somehow the prosecution was able to convict him every single time. After looking at all of the information, and I have most of it in court documents, again, linked down below, the opinion of the Court of Appeals was that the prosecution provided numerous times highly improbable theories that essentially distorted the evidence into what they needed it to be. And they did this to, and I quote, an extreme degree. So basically, what we're witnessing through all three of these trials is that the prosecution couldn't use the physical evidence because they knew it likely wouldn't match to Juan. So they instead used questionable circumstantial evidence or just like briefly pointed towards evidence that could suggest he was there um, through their wild theories that they created. By December 9th, 2011, the Illinois Court of Appeals ruled that Juan's conviction was unjustified in a three to zero ruling so on January 6, 2012, it was deemed the conviction would be overturned and they even barred the state from ever trying him again because Michael Waller just so relentlessly kept coming back the times that he had been released. Granted, the state attorneys could appeal despite the fact that they barred them from trying him again, the state appeals could have put in an appeal to the court of appeals. It's very confusing, I know. Basically saying they wanted to reinstate the conviction and here are the reasons why. And it would have to be like very serious. Um, solid evidence to get them to do that. But again, that would be a lot of work. They have 35 days to file that. And Michael Waller obviously thought about it because he didn't finally say until 11 days before the deadline that he agreed to dismiss the charges and Juan was set free. This was a huge moment because Juan had spent 20 years in prison for murder that he didn't commit. And in 2005, they found that DNA didn't even link him to the crime, but he still sat in prison for like seven more years after that, which is absolutely insane to me. But upon being freed, he was incredibly grateful. His whole family showed up. They held his hand as he walked out of the prison and he said he was starting a new chapter in life, that he was putting this behind him, that he knows he's innocent and now he hopes the world understands he's innocent and he was gonna go to college and he was going to just hit the ground running. Juan was given a certificate of innocence when he was released along with $213,600 in compensation for his time spent wrongfully in prison, which roughly calculates to what, like $10,000 or something a year, which is just wild. Um, but in October of 2012, almost a year after being released, he filed a wrongful conviction suit against Lake County, which I am cheering him on that he did that. And it's interesting because he actually, in this lawsuit, raised allegations that he was framed, that Lake County police planted evidence on him. Early on in 2015, a federal judge ordered that tests be done to determine if Juan was correct that Lake County had in fact created or fabricated evidence in his case. Um, in his trials, as you remember, there was this pair of shoes that they said had Holly's blood on it. Now, they tried to enter this as evidence, their biggest physical evidence in the first trial. And when the defense pointed it out that, whoa, 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 he didn't have those shoes during the murder, they withdrew the evidence and then didn't say anything. The shoes were then located and they were tested. And it was found that Holly's blood was in fact on this pair of shoes despite Juan being gifted the pair of shoes well after her murder. Now, unfortunately, before this could go any further, which in my opinion strongly indicates that this county is corrupt as it gets and 
uh, plant evidence on people simply because they don't want to actually do their job. Before anything came out on March of 2015, they settled. Ironic that they settled. The second that it's pretty much proven that they plant evidence on individuals. It was a settlement for 20 million. So I am ecstatic for Juan that he was compensated that much compared to the measly amount he was originally given. I actually went down this whole rabbit hole of looking into Lake County, Illinois, and allegedly this is a big thing. Um, there's tons and tons and tons of different blogs and Reddit threads and forums where people speak about all of the different cases in Lake County, Illinois, where it is known that you know, they wrongfully convict people, that they plant evidence, and then even more so the prosecution. What you saw in this case, the prosecution, the crazy allegations that they said, um, the crazy theories they put forward, when I tell you it gets worse and there are other people who have had it worse with these crazy accusations, I'm not joking. I saw some very disturbing things that prosecutors said and they shouldn't have their job anymore. So Juan was released. He was given compensation. He lost 20 years of his life, but he was optimistic moving forward but that still left holly staker's murderer out there the murderer was never found it had been well over 20 years but then all of a sudden the dna profile from holly staker's case popped up linking to a case in regards to a burglary and attempted murder in chicago illinois in january of 2000 so years, almost a decade after Holly was murdered while Juan sat in jail for this person's crime, they went on and attacked another person. And that's just the one person we know of so far. A 29 year old man named Delwyn Foxworth was in his home in North Chicago. Three different robbers made their way into his home while he was there with his girlfriend and attacked him at gunpoint. These robbers beat Delwyn Foxworth with a two by four and repeatedly demanded him to give up all of his money. They kept saying like, give up the cash or it was, it was some direct phrase, um, but they were demanding his money or their money. I think they were even claiming. And when Foxworth refused to give them any of the money, they covered him in gasoline and set him on fire. He extinguished the flame somehow and went to a neighbor's house for help. I think his girlfriend may have fled to save herself. Um, I'm not sure exactly again the scenario. Um, and he did manage to survive these wounds, but he was in some sort of care for the next, I think, two years, and then eventually he died from them. Now, authorities ended up pretty quickly arresting a man named Marvin Tyrone Williford, who was someone that Foxworth knew, and Foxworth owed money to this man. And I'm not sure exactly what, you know, put this man into the picture, how they were directly led to him, but they did arrest him and charge him um, in the occurrence. And they, the other two or three individuals were never captured. During Williford's trial, Foxworth's girlfriend, who was there when this attack started, described someone that matched Williford's appearance being uh, the one that was holding the two by four, that Williford was holding the two by four and he was the one that was repeatedly hitting Foxworth. Between that and the motive of money and the fact that whoever came in asked for their money, he ended up being convicted in 2004 and was sentenced to 80 years in prison. Now, years later, the DNA from the 2x4 was tested. They took samples, tested the DNA, and Foxworth's blood was on the 2x4, as well as, I believe, three other individuals. But none of the profiles belonged to Williford, and one of the profiles matched the one from Holly Staker's attack. So this makes it very safe to assume that one of the individuals involved in Foxworth's attack was also responsible for Holly's murder. However, there is a huge predicament here. So Williford has maintained his innocence and still maintains his innocence. And when this DNA came out, 
Williford and his attorney tried to use it to get him a new trial, saying that this proved he was not at the crime scene. They essentially tried to copy what happened with Juan. Since Foxworth's girlfriend identified him and directly pointed him out as being the one that she saw with the two by four, um, the fact that his DNA wasn't on it, they thought was exculpatory evidence. He would, you know, be dismissed. This all would be overturned. But despite a long battle in 2018, Williford was denied a new trial. They stated that just because the DNA on the two by four didn't match to him, because there were numerous individuals at the residence, and of course the motive potentially involved, that this in no way meant he was not a part of the crime just because that DNA was found there. It just means that they still haven't caught the two to three other individuals that were involved in the crime crime. But this is where we have a problem, is that obviously maintaining innocence means that Williford either can't or won't name the other individuals at the crime. Again, one of which is responsible for Holly Staker's sexual assault and murder. That would immediately incriminate him. And he seems pretty adamant that he was not a part of this crime. So again, he either can't say who was there because he doesn't want to incriminate himself, or he just won't because he wants to keep this possibility open that he will be released from prison. There is a huge debate online, again, in many different forums on whether Williford was also wrongfully convicted. I know that they did go back and retest DNA that was found on the gasoline can, um, other DNA that was found around the home. It was still these um, other profiles found on the two by four, but Williford's DNA was still not found anywhere. So maybe he really doesn't have any knowledge of the crime and he was wrongfully convicted. Um, but if that's not the case, again, he holds all the answers to not just the attack against Foxworth, but the attack on Holly. A lot of people believe that if he was in fact responsible, he might hand over that information in hopes of getting an appeal. Um, maybe he can trade, you know, one favor for another, but unfortunately in 2020, that didn't come up when he was at his most recent appeal. He was rejected again, so I don't know. I don't know if he actually knows anything, but there are plenty of people that believe he was absolutely involved and is holding the answers and is just keeping his mouth shut. It's just very frustrating because I, first of all, don't understand why in all of these cases, DNA testing wasn't done off the bat. And again, I know it's way more prevalent now than even a decade ago, but it's so frustrating to know that we had that technology and it could have very easily disproved someone was responsible of an attack and we just didn't use it. And the failure in finding the real attacker in Holly's case and throwing Juan in prison because they just put blinders on, not only was a total injustice to her and a total injustice to her family, as well as a total injustice to Juan, but it led to the attack and death of another man almost a decade later. And like I said, that's just all that we know so far. When you look at this criminal and this pattern of behavior, they have had the audacity to break in to a home where an 11 year old is and they just like and stabbed her 27 times and sexually assaulted her in front of a two-year-old child and then they set a man on fire like I know that there were 30 some individuals that were registered sex offenders in the area where Holly was at the time. Um, I saw it reported on one article that none of those individuals had their DNA compared to the sample taken from Holly. I don't know if that's ever been done up until this point. I honestly just don't trust that police department in general to push further in this case to find out who actually killed her. But if you think about the entire situation of Holly Staker's murder, I don't know how frequently she babysat these children. I don't know if this was the first time or if she did it every single day during the summer. I feel like it had to have been someone local, someone that could have seen her outside with this little boy. Was it just someone driving by that took you know, an opportunity hoping that parents weren't home or was it someone who knew for a fact that she babysat these kids by herself and they watched her for an extended period of time? If that's the case, again, I'm assuming it is someone local. I hope all of those 30 plus individuals that were registered sex offenders eventually have their DNA tested against the sample taken. And then even more so, did any of those individuals move away to Chicago? I feel like this should be such a freaking solvable case. And so I do not 
understand why there's still no answers in it. I feel like so much got caught up with authorities when it came to trying the wrong person that again, Holly and her murder just slipped into the background and people forgot that she deserve justice that someone out there is capable of doing this to a young child and could do it to more and this gives me these very eerie vibes that once this person is found there's just going to be this ridiculously lengthy history of murders under this person's belt i feel like if you're capable of doing these two things that is not the first time you've done this it is not the last time you've done it everything about this case and every other case that is involved or somehow connected blows my mind. I just don't understand it. And not only was the prosecution and the state attorney just fighting to keep him in jail numerous times, but the one thing that I keep thinking of is how did the jury come to this conclusion so many times? And I feel like when you take a bunch of individuals that already don't know much about the law and throw them in a situation where they get to decide the fate of somebody else, that's already very difficult. That is a heavy weight to carry. But I almost feel as if Lake County officials made sure to push them so hard when they were in deliberation um, they obviously were arguing with each other. There was a lot of tension and if you want things to go a certain way, you're just gonna sit back and keep feeding the fire. And I felt that's what they did. And these people, in order to just get out of the situation the same way Juan did, just said whatever they needed to. And I feel, I genuinely feel like that. I feel like Lake County just pressured everyone involved from Juan to the jurors to just say what they wanted them to say to get this over with. My hope at this point is that somehow genealogy gets involved. Um, I'm hoping this is a case they're already working on or it's on the top of the list because you have DNA. I feel like that is the newest best technology that could make the largest difference in this case in catching Holly's killer and the attacker of Delwyn Foxworth. I hope that I can eventually make an update on this video to tell you guys that that is exactly what happened because I can't imagine how Holly's family still feels to this day. But that is all that I have for you guys. Make sure that you go and check out the Innocence Project and they have a bunch of different cases that they have personally worked on and want to get information out on. And definitely also listen to the audiobook that I suggested because there's just so much to this and it's absolutely crazy to me. And I feel like more people should take into consideration wrongful convictions when it comes to, you know, sentencing and the death penalty and things like that, because there are so many mistakes that are made. But on that note, I'm going to go ahead and go, you guys. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to the story of all of these individuals. Hopefully there will eventually be some answers. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Also, if you haven't already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button to become a part Part of the Howland fam so that we can hopefully bring them home together and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.